Live. Okay, we're all live now. Community dinner, what's the, December 11th, so it's the end of 9-11, we're on 12-11 today. 12-11-20. Yeah. Um, we're going to transition from fall foods and eating and have a, a new introduction of winter eating. We'll continue with the sensory gates and the mucus and the, the six pernicious influences and there's other thing over here I had. We have all kinds of fun topics. The assemblage points and the perception points and the who is the perceiver stuff and how food affects your consciousness. And tonight we're going to also add in um, the seven conditions of health by, this is one of his books, uh, George Sosawa. Um, so I came up with natural law from this dude's book. I was reading his work about 30 years ago. Um, he was the founder. He was the tree that, on the top of the macrobiotic tree. He was the guy that came over and the, Oh God, his story, oh, this is worthy actually, worthy story. So this guy's a lot of credibility. He was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia over in Japan and when he was 14 and he was supposed to live past 18. Um, he had problems his whole youth and whatnot. And, um, and he's convinced that the problem came because of white rice. Because wow. after, after World War II, they started the white rice thing. Um, yeah, he had, uh, and he ran into it. He was, his whole family was sick, but he, um, he went and sought out like an old Taoist, really. It wasn't Chinese medicine back then. It was sort of getting, you know, they've been forming it for a while, but what Chinese medicine is a dumbed down version of what the Indians were doing in China. And we call them the Taoists. They're living out in the mountains. And the Chinese, there was a Confucian revolution and the Mao revolution. And you better believe that the ancient teachings back there have been dumbed down, <laughs> just like they have here. Um, so this guy went to the went to this old master, and the guy was like, "Oh yeah, you got to go from white rice to brown rice, and you got to eat more raw food, and you got to do miso." And um, so the thing with miso, another digression is that miso is a fungus. And who asked me about the fungus earlier? Oh, you you did, you're right, right. And so when you have bacterial overgrowth, it means you don't have enough fungus in your body. And when you have fungal overgrowth, it means you don't have enough bacteria in your body. It's literally that simple. So the, one of the best medicines for SIBO is, guess what, Roquefort. Wow. Wow. It's fungus. It secretes anti antibacterials. So, I mean, a few of my people have taken, taken me up on it, and you gotta work your way towards something like that, though. You don't just you know, come from SIBO to eating Roquefort and expect everything to be okay. You're gonna have a, what you're gonna have is an infantry line Small intestine, sorry, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for asking because it goes over a lot of people's heads. So it's basically like there's different forms of imbalance, just harmony down there. And so like my, I was always battling fungus because I wasn't breastfed and I was a sugar addict. And the first thing that they inoculated this body was soy sugar formula with synthet synthetic vitamins. You know, so that's what the foundation of what my gut biology was based on. It took a long time to overcome that. But then some people, they get bacterial overgrowth. And I gave myself that consciously by eating too many probiotics in the 90s. Walk on the edge, walk on the edge. I mean, if you're a surfer, you walk the edge. And so I just learned, like, 40 years ago, I started surfing. It's like, you got to walk the edge. And so that's, it's like, this is a test tube, and I'm going to, oh, God, what did I do down there, you know, three hours later? I mean, don't even talk about all the things I've tried with enemas. You know, you talk about pain and agony. You know, you, you don't want to try some of the enemas I've tried. Um, wait, wait. Well, wait, wait on the question. Oh, okay. yeah, we try the questions come in um, in an yeah. organized so I can, I, I'm already okay. digressing a lot. Right. So the yeast is a fungus. So there's these large families in the biology kingdom. And so yeast and fungus and seaweed are actually all related as they go up the ladder together. Um, so we gotta go all the way back to Osawa. So miso, thanks, gotta <laughs> bring myself back. Um, Osawa, ended up living to be about 64, 65. If you really go along the story, he, he started eating better and he got off the white and the refined foods. And it was, it was about fresh local organic was kind of the theme as it got brought in with um, Shea Panini and Alice Waters, you know, from Berkeley. She, that was one of her mottos for that restaurant, you know, fresh local organic. And I've been harping about vitamin C now and I have so much evidence. I have this article from Tim O'Shea and we talked about synthetic vitamins on Wednesday in my my group with Monica and and I'm I'm on a research just a rant right now I can't get enough of it because it, that vitamin C is your marker of freshness and it drops up to ninety percent after it's picked twenty four hours later a green bean drops the vitamin C content but they're measuring so it's it's like 
the vitality. And the, so what this guy learned, Osawa learned, was vitality, chi. So if you're getting rice too, I mean, the macaroni people, they are such snobs with rice. I mean, oh my God. Like if it was hold more than a few months old, they're like, oh, throw it over there for the peasants, you know? So I had freshly hold rice, which is what we get, that crap we get in the health food store. That's been hold like six to nine months, you know, in some places. It's, it's like, wow, I, I can see why. Because it's, it's loaded with vitality. It's loaded with chi. That's why seeds, when they, they germinate well after the next year, but every year you have seeds, they don't germinate as much. Why? Because their life force evacuates. That's why. I mean, the Kamut seed survived 2,000 years in King Tut's tomb. You know, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, that, that's an awesome story too. Um, you know, some Iowa, Illinois farmer, you know, grows this heirloom form of wheat, Kamut. And by the way, hint, hint for your sourdough bread makers, best bread ever. Fresh ground Kamut berries. Mm. It makes a great fluffy sourdough bread. Oh my God, worth getting. Mm. So, um, Osawa, ironically, um, these great macrobiotic teachers, um, all three of them. So, he had two students, Herman Ayahara, which is this dude. He wrote a book called, that's his famous book, Acid and Alkaline. And he had a center out here in the Sierras. I'd like, I'd like to go visit sometime. And his wife, Cornelia, outlived him. Um, and Osawa here, he died at 64, but his wife uh, lived to be over 100. Wow. And then Michio Kushi, who I don't have his book up, but he went out to the East Coast in Boston. And um, he was a real scoundrel, his wife, but she outlived him too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I find that very humorous. But Osawa, the point of it all is, is Osawa came up with what I call the seven conditions of health. And it... I read, I read it and then I go, well, this is related to the Ten Commandments kind of stuff. And the Ten Commandments are not commandments. That was a very purposefully stupid translation to manipulate yeah. people. Right. The Ten Commandments are the Ten Road Signs on the Road of Life kind of mm -hmm. thing. If you want to murder somebody, you're not spiritually healthy. Yeah. If you want to steal, it's a marker. There's no morality associated with it at all. It's like, here's, here's the template. If you want to do these things, you're out of balance. When you sin, you miss the mark. That's what that means. You miss the mark, you, you made an error, you went against your deeper nature, you already knew, but you went against it, and you repent by turning around and examining what went wrong. You repent your sin, there's no morality associated with this stuff whatsoever. But that's part of the gaslighting that's been done to humanity for, I mean, at least a couple thousand years, as far as I can see, it might be as long as our history. We've been gaslit, I mean, we're still living under two Roman emperors, Julius and Augustus. I don't give a fuck about Julius and Augustus Caesar. We're still at two months honoring them. It's retarded, but you know, nevertheless. So the seven conditions of health, um, you know, even after 25 years of kind of examining it, I think it's a good conceptual model. And of course the 10 commandments are a great conceptual model on some level too, you know, if you want to sleep with your best friend's wife chronically, you might want to look why you want to do that. You know, you know adultery is, actually that's a worthy question. Um, when does adultery begin? Does it begin with the thought or the indulgence in the thought? The thought. Yeah. Adultery begins with the thought. Are we all in agreement on that? Do you think adultery mm -hmm. begins with the thought? The, ra the random thought that you have no control over? It starts there? Really? I don't know if we're all I don't, really it's I, a really great I don't think yeah. adultery starts with the random <laughs> thought because you can't yeah. control your thoughts. Yeah. Nobody in this room can. That's true. I know. It's whether you indulged in it and throw logs on the fire. That, That's to true. me, is when adultery begins. Yeah. 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 We know when we're doing that. Right. It's noticeable. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I think the same is true of feeling, too. Like, you don't have control over your feelings, but you have control over what you do with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Um, and that's self-responsibility. That separates the child from the adult, really. You know, I'm taking responsibility for my asinine behavior, and I have to do it daily because I have a lot of asinine behavior, but that's okay. I have fun with it, and uh, I've got my own version of, uh, I like James's word, Tasmanian devil. He was really out today, man. I, was, I had a little, I had a rifle and a sword behind me all day today. Ah, fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> he was out big time today, and you didn't want to deal with me today at all. Um, then I went and cried, and it all got better, so that's great. So the first of which is, um, and probably on the top of the pyramid is, if you, can you sleep well? That's one of his top conditions for health. Can you sleep well? So what does that mean, though? We can have a little discussion. 
What does it mean to sleep well? I have one parameter for sleep, and that's it. That you feel rested? That you feel rested when you wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Or you get the REM, the REM. Well, that's too much mind stuff. It's, this is subjective. I think like, also yeah. falling asleep easily. Falling asleep easily. Mm -hmm. Those two would be really yeah. hard to. Yeah, do you feel refreshed when you wake up? You bounce, you bounce out yeah. of bed or you just like sluggishly pour over the side? Well, there's the manipulation too, is we get, we get brainwashed into this in elementary school. You got to get ready for your nine to five, five day a week work week. And a lot of people don't, that's not their schedule. They need, they, they're not morning people, you know, and you throw them into school and they're like, oh, you don't know, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like show up to school at noon and shit, you know, then there's the morning people, let them go to school at 8 a.m., you know, and, uh, I was always a morning person, but. I mean, at 8 a.m., I was just pissed when I was a teenager, and I, just, I was just fucking with the teachers, um, the poor teachers. But anyways, I digress again. So sleep, and um, yeah, do you feel refreshed when you wake up? I had this woman in Cal Poly when I was studying nutrition, and she was an animal. I mean, she had three kids, single mom, working, school full-time, 15 units, and working to support the family. And so I'm like, when do you sleep? She goes, oh. Two to six. Wow. I'm like, oh my God. and she was refreshed though. She claims she was refreshed after four hours of sleep. So I don't believe it's quantity for some people. Physiologically, I tend to lean to the eight to 10 hours myself, but man, the last thing I want to do is shame somebody for, right. you know, she got four hours of sleep and she was fine. What was I supposed to say? You know, like challenge her? Yeah, she's fine. I would keep my eye on someone like that. And you know how you check? How do you check vitality, Monica? Mm. Quiz time. There's one test, my one Pulse. test. Uh, while, while standing? Oh, blood I thought it was. Blood pressure lying down, standing. Blood pressure. Oh. The raglines test. Lying down. Standing and then lying down. I think everybody, yeah. yeah. I think everybody should have a blood pressure cup just for that reason, because it's a way you can objectify your vitality. We all need a little more <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Objectify us even Sorry. more. Um, you shouldn't move here. very much. So no, so the way this test works is you lay down for five minutes, you're horizontal, and then the body starts to relax, right? So the blood pressure and the pulse will drop, uh, generally. And then, so you take the blood pressure when you're laying down, and then you stand up and you immediately take that upon standing, and like, like immediately as fast as you can. So now you're pumping blood uphill to the brain against gravity, right? So the pressure's gotta go up in the system a little bit. So um, a doctor developed this, Dr. Raglan in the 70s, and um, it was a great marker of well, how you could monitor adrenal fatigue and adrenal improvement. And um, where did that test go? <laughs> Into the toilet, because it's not technologically cool with the long report and the $500 technology and the fancy machine. Right? Yeah. We call this barefoot doctor stuff. I love the barefoot doctor. That's what I am, you know? They're, you, know you guys are like barefoot doctors. For, we're all for the earth, you know? Everybody here is pretty much a barefoot earth doctor um, to some level. So... It should all rise five. So your, your systolic, diastolic, and pulse should all rise five when you stand up. So if you're 115 over 75 with a pulse of 55 lying down, then it should go to 120 over 80 with a pulse of 60 when you stand up, ideally. And this is how I measure harmony in the system. So I had a client the other day, her systolic fell 15, her diastolic fell six, but her pulse went up five. So the blood pressure cuff also measures um, an irregularity in a heartbeat palpitation, which is usually stress, B vitamin, and mineral deficiency. Um, there can be other reasons, but those are the, those are the three low-hanging fruits that I always tend to look for. Um, because the nervous system and the heart, I mean, and potassium and magnesium are generally important too, but uh, anyways, I digress again. So the sleep is a, hi Joanne. Um, so the sleep is as important as any of the rest. And um, if you don't sleep well, then you don't do, this is a great yin and yang thing. We've talked about this a bunch of times. So those are fire folks. So in yin and yang then, the log is the yin and the yang is the fire. See? There's a way to look at yin and yang and how do you restore your log? By sleeping. You can only restore your log with rest. You can't kick the tired mule and keep stimulating it, you know, with caffeine all day and expect it to do well in the long run. So 
people, we talk about, Joanne knows yin deficiency in America. And so you restore your yin by sleep and by following the rhythms of the universe, which is going to bed, hopefully, you know, 10 to 11. Earlier, better in the winter, for sure. Um, and I don't know, what was that adage? It seems to work for me. If you go to bed before 10 or 11, every hour counts as an extra hour. It seems to be that way. Also, there's something about your gallbladder rests at 2 a.m. Well, the body is purifying the blood when you go to sleep. It starts to purify the blood, and the spleen and the liver are involved. And it does, you know, it's a purification process. And then, so if you're awake during that time, especially in eating, which I do too much because I'm generally I don't wind down till later because of my job. And um, so then you're not purifying your blood as much. And I never feel as arrested personally um, as when I finish eating at six or seven and let the belly be sort of empty going to bed. Um, so sleep, that's how important it is. And I even, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm anti-drug as much as anybody in the universe, but I've, I've said to some clients, like maybe you need to look at sleeping medications. And Monica, what's my rule for medications? How long do you need to have an escape plan? How many months? Yeah, three to six months, six tops. Um, a great story about this, actually. Uh, this client of mine, he, oh God, long story, but I'll try to make it quick. This client of mine, he didn't have a memory for 30 years. He, he was just living in the present moment, but he was like a genius. So Google executives would hire him and Intel executives and his, his wife and his family would sort of keep, his, keep him in line. You know, he, he wouldn't remember from one moment to the next, but in the moment he was like a savant, you know, just like Casey, Edgar Casey, he was just channel brilliance. And so people would like have, you know, recording devices and notepads and he was around. And, um, and then so he was seeing this homeopath and um, Joanna Chow at Five Branches. Um, and there was one point where Joanna told him, go see me, because he was sort of ready, because, I mean, you, you, you kind of got to be ready to see me. You need some prior warning, usually, because um, I got a lot of fire. So we had him getting memories within six to nine months. Um, he was getting his memory back, and he's now with me about three years, and he had, the guy had parasites in his brain. He's, oh, he's wow. bald right here, and he had parasites in his brain. Wow. He, he was, this is a Craig case. These are the cases I asked for. What kind of referrals do you want, Craig? Send me the hardest ones. The ones you can't figure out. It's my favorites. This guy was one of those. Oh my God. So he was in the other day and he had people drift away. Like, you know, I stick with standard process for a reason. Because it's a family-owned company on a big regenerative farm in large North America. And it's whole food. You know, you can't replace whole food vitamins, which are frequencies and processes and phytochemistry, with something made in a lab with coal mining waste. You just can't do it. You know, so he had drifted over there a little bit. He had a synthetic form of retinol that some healer had talked him into, which is vitamin A. Um, and retinol, when it's isolated, causes the symptoms it's supposed to cure. I reminded him of that. He was on a synthetic form of vitamin D, which I am not a fan of taking only D3. Um, it really upsets red blood cell metabolism, and nobody talks about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, and I got the data to back it all up. And man, you just can't believe that the conspiracy around all these synthetic nutrients, ascorbic acid, you know, that one got so much data around that we were talking about in class. And so this guy had leaned a little over there and he had a bunch of symptoms. And I'm examining what he's taking and I'm like, dude, we don't need to add on anything. We need to take all this other stuff out. And there's your symptoms. So he's gonna be a report in a couple of days and we'll find out. So it's like, I mean, clients love to hear that, right? I mean, you want me to buy nothing? I don't take the month off. Don't take anything this month. Just clear your system out, man. And he's horrified because he's in pain and he has, he still has memory issues, but he's got his life back. Um, and it's a good example of, he's starting to sleep well too, but I mean, the guy, the guy's skull plates are cracking. Like he was so calcified that he says, oh yeah, I felt this whole thing go this morning. Yeah, it's just, he's a great case. He's a genius, you know? And all my supplements I give him that I recommend, he goes up and he does, this is his muscle testing method. He closes his eyes and it's like, toward means yes. He, he said he introduces a statement. He says, is this good for me? And he goes towards it to yes. And, and, um, and he can spot supplements. He, I did a blind test with him a couple of times and he kept picking the same one that his body wanted. I was impressed. That's science right there, right? Yeah, we could, re, we could duplicate the experiment. This guy was sharp. Like I say, he's a savant. So that's enough for sleep. Mm. But speaking of energy, I'll pick on that. So good energy. And so we would need to not pathologize bad energy. So what would you say? I have a sort of a one word sentence about energy. 
you have enough energy if, fill in the blank. Do I want to try? You can do what you want. Great. What else? If you can uh, run 100 miles, and not, I mean 100 yards and not get winded. If you run 100 miles, not get winded. 100 yards. 100 yards, not getting winded. Anybody else got enough energy if, you have enough energy if, you know you have enough energy if, fill in the blank. Vitality. Yeah, you know, you, okay, vitality. You take care of yourself. Yeah, you stay awake you take care during yourself. the day. Stay awake during the day. Without stimulants. Without stimulants. <laughs> yeah, right. Without stimulants. That's what I tell my clients. Oh, I have good energy all day. And I go, yeah, you're on 500 milligrams of caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> sure, good energy. Um, mine is, I have a very simple one of energy. I know I have enough energy if I can fulfill my wishes and dreams during the day. It's inadequate if I have, that's without why I was- Without stimulants. Without stimulants, right. Yeah. That was part of my tears earlier, as I called it divine frustration, because um, I'm limited. I can't save the world. I, I try, and um, it's really frustrating, because people are so resistant. Like Yogananda said, you know, Parma Hansa Yogananda, he had a lovely thing about this. He says, people are so skillful with their ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Right? Isn't that good? Yeah. People are so skillful with their ignorance. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Yogananda. Yeah, there's Babaji. He's looking over us in that lineage. So energy. Um, and should you have more energy after you eat? You've been through this three zillion times with me. Yep. Yes. If you don't have that green by now, man, you've flunked my class. <laughs> you've flunked. You go back to kindergarten. <laughs> right. So, and if you don't have energy after you eat, what do you do? Nope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's right. No, what do you do? <laughs> That's all great, but there's something there's something to do inward, right? What do you gotta do inwardly? Make a note. You gotta yeah. journal, examine what you just oh, ate. Yeah. You gotta examine what you just yeah. ate and identify yeah. what the problem yeah. was. Yeah. I spent 15, 20 years doing this. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely a solution. Although. Definitely. So it's, there are tools for this, and that's what you, know, you have journals for, or computers are great, the phone, the chronometer app. If, you know, I, that's probably one of the walkaways tonight, is get that chronometer app on your phone or on the computer. It's just a great tracking device, and it's free. Um, so energy, let's see anything else. You know, you can actually take it down to this level, because we got the time for it. So there's kind of two main energy organs in the body, um, in the endocrine system. Um, and Joanne can't answer because she probably already knows, but anybody know what they are? The two main energy organs in the body, as far as the distribution and activation of energy. What about the kidney? The kidneys. What's on, what, what's on top of the kidney? Liver? Adrenal. They call the, 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 the adrenal is called the suprarenal. It's right on top of the kidney. It's like a cap. It's like a little cap on the kidney's head. That's what the adrenal is. Because in Chinese medicine, don't they say that your energy comes from your kidney? Yeah, I'm just thinking like yeah. endocrine wise. Like uh, the kidney is an endocrine organ, is a little, okay. but okay. yeah, I, I agree 100%. Okay. Okay. Um, I have to go, we have to go to the Western mind though. So the, the HPA axis, as it's called, is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but it's got to include the thyroid and the gonads too. So, um, and you know, the ovary or the testicles. That's your main endocrine axis. Um, and it's always, they're all interacting together, all those organs. So I mean, you get your thyroid hormone test, and they usually test TSH. But that's not a thyroid hormone. It's a pituitary hormone. It's a thyroid stimulating hormone. So you can't diagnose low thyroid based on the pituitary hormone. It's retarded. But they do it. They can sell more drugs and cut your thyroid out. Um, oh yeah, it's a great emotional sale. I mean, I've seen it a million times. Believe me. So thyroid and adrenal. And um, you'll like this, Joanne. So adrenal, you know, kidney yang which is, you can measure it in a pulse. There's the kidney yin on one side and kidney yang on the other. And then uh, the triple warmer I've often correlated with thyroid function, because it's how energy is distributed in three burning spaces. That's exactly what the thyroid does, it's cellular metabolism. And so what is the main nutrient 
of the thyroid? Iodine. Yeah. And not just one form, but remember I've been over this, two forms of iodine? Yeah. Potassium iodide in two parts and elemental iodine in one part. That's your Lugol solution that's been around since 1840. There's nothing new and improved about iodine. Anybody that's making one of these nascent shit and all this new and improved iodine shit? Lugol's, there was no reason to rock the boat. You were always getting results with it. So you don't need to change and rock the boat. The stuff works. And you have that with some seaweed, and you've got a whole iodine spectrum there. Iodine's a very unstable element. So um, thyroid uses it to, Bernard Jensen calls iodine a, a, a checkpoint or a calming element. It's a very large molecule in terms of molecule size compared to the others. Mm. On the periodic table of the elements, James, iodine's the biggest nutritional molecule to go in our body. So it requires an escalator to get into the cell. It's so big. Like it needs an escort. It's so big to get into the cell. And that's called the Symporter system. S-Y-M-P-O-R-T-E-R, the Symporter system. And that Symporter system requires all these nutrients to drive it. And that's why people say they're allergic to iodine. <laughs> oh, I take iodine and seaweed and I get sick. You can't be allergic to iodine because it's in the thyroid hormone. So you would die. You can't be allergic to iodine by definition. It's an essential nutrient. So what happens when you take iodine though is our body, the iodine doesn't get into the cell fast enough because there's not enough escorts. And then it starts kicking out bromine and chlorine and fluoride. And we're loaded with that stuff the four other halogen elements that are related to iodine on the periodic table. My personal theory is, as most of us, we are so pathetically deficient in iodine, I believe our body is making thyroid hormone from chlorine and bromine and fluorine. I mean, I believe our, I believe our body is transmuting it and making these faulty thyroid hormones and that's part of our thyroid crisis that many people have. And plus, the, the medical people, they don't tie thyroid function to liver function, but it's, they're intimately tied together. And we've known this over 100 years. But we got steered astray by the, let's well, say the Satanists. The Satanists kind of steered us astray for, I mean, medically, we're, we're behind at least 100 years. At least, maybe yeah. 150. Yeah. I mean, yeah, most of the stuff I'm talking about was talked about 100 years ago. It's, it's insane to me. Are you saying you can't be allergic to iodine? No, so you cannot be allergic to iodine. So it's a detox. And so what we do is, um, the best book about all this is David Brownstein's book called Iodine and Why You Need It. Um, David Brownstein, MD. And so you need B vitamins to run the escalator. You need vitamin C whole food form to run the escalator. You need selenium and zinc and magnesium. That might be all of it. And so if you don't, so what I do is I have people load up for two or three months on the nutrients and get their escalator all built up while they're taking organically bound minerals, which is a seaweed tablet. And then you work your way in and then you get the slow, gradual detox. I, mean, I have a client that she's ulcerative colitis and she's so sensitive, she can only take one or two organically bound minerals pills. And the iodine equivalent in one pill is 200 micrograms, basically twice the RDA. And um, the ODA, what we call, what we're going to develop with, with the team with Monica here, uh, I started promoting it five to 10 years ago, but we're going to come back with it. And that's the ODA, the optimal daily allowance versus the RDA, which is the minimum required for life. What about the optimal daily allowance, which is 10 milligrams for iodine? 10 milligrams a day is the optimal daily amount. We know that because of the Japanese and how much seaweed they ate and how good their thyroid function. And their skin, too. Thyroid's connected to skin. Thyroid, liver, skin triangle, though. There's all these triangles in the body. So iodine, and then what about the adrenals? You're we talking to a client, that same client's talking about. What are the main nutrients of the adrenal? What does the adrenal love to get for food? Organ nutrition. We're coming into winter, so this is good. This is really relevant for winter, too. Uh, sure, agreed. I hadn't thought of that one, though, but I agree. Yeah, we could add that to the list. Fats. Fats. Yes, uh, that will calm down an overactive adrenal, but fats for someone that has an underactive adrenal would be sort of devastating. They'd have to do carbohydrates for energy. Um, but it's, it's still, you're on the right track. Because water controls fire, but there's um, sodium, and the sodium, potassium, teeter-totter. You go potassium rich in the summer and sodium rich in the winter. So generally, um, I notice my salt cravings start going up. So salt and the adrenals have a, a very intimate relationship. And guess what? I read one of my healer friends and said that he believed that if JFK, who was, he had low-grade Wilson's disease, and that's a kidney issue, if he would have done salt, good quality salt every day, he would, have had, he would have been able to avoid the drugs because he was on drugs. Um, there was a BBC documentary called The Kennedys. That's a, it's fantastic. 
Um, probably still, James probably tell poke holes in it. Oh, the sourcing, you know. Blah, blah, blah. BBC's probably bought out by somebody, you know. <laughs> yeah. We need Howard here too. Howard and Dave to really seal that whole triad up. Okay, so I got stuck on energy. I better move along, or this is going to take three freaking hours. Um, adrenals, we didn't finish. So vitamin C, whole food C, is an adrenal food. Vitamin C is an adrenal food. <laughs> So much so that, you know, the natives, when they, how do the natives in the freezing cold weather get vitamin C? They're eating meat, so you stick, a, you stick a reindeer in the snow and cut chunks out of it when you need to, so where are you getting your vitamin C? One, there's one organ in that, in that animal, in all mammals, that stores the C mostly. And I just mentioned it. The adrenals. The adrenals. The adrenals itself. Yeah, look, look, cut the adrenals out. And they'll give a little teeny piece to everybody. Oh. Raw, of course. I've eaten raw buffalo adrenals, and um, I can't say I enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> was it chewy? <laughs> yeah, too chewy, actually. Um, yeah, uh, that night was a, a story in itself. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for bringing that back. I wanted to mention, so the iodine loading protocol that I've been through once already is 50 milligrams for about two years daily, which is the, the Lugal solution. Each drop has six milligrams of, I, of iodine. So that's how many, six times five is 30, six times, about six to seven drops of Lugals in a glass of water. Um, I, have a, I have a gallon of Lugals, by the way, I made years ago. and. Um, it's easy to make. You just got to get the elemental iodine. So what happens is, um, I'm going to have to take the question later because we're going to get down this list, but the iodine, um, if you're going to a chlorinated swimming pool, this guy swam every day. So I said, look, you need to be taking iodine before you go in the pool. Otherwise your body's a sponge for all that, all those halogen elements. Wow. And I used to get allergy attacks after swimming in chlorinated pools. And now it makes so much sense to me. Wow. It was the freaking chlorine. Yeah. Right, it lodges in a lot of places. Yeah, right. So let's move right along. Um, thanks. I forgot about that. Um, when I had to get a CAT scan, they insisted on me having iodine. Well, when I had the iodine put in my system, it gave me automatically like bronchitis pneumonia kind of thing that was automatically happening after the iodine in my system. Yeah, that's detox. That's massive and rapid yeah. detox is what that is. Um, okay, so energy. Um, there's, we could go into this organ nutrition thing. It's fascinating, but we'll move along to appetite. So appetite for what are the three appetites? Mm -hmm. You have appetite for three things. You can you can make up more, but tasty food, water, <laughs> savory, food, water. Okay. Food, food, water. food, water. Okay, one more. Food and water. One more. Love. There you go. Love. Yeah. Companionship. You could say sex, but I don't think that really covers it. I think that's too shallow. I think it's connection with a being. You know, like like you know, you're just connected, and whether you're making love or not, you're connected. You know, and like. And so, and you know, the Enneagram, they have, don't they have those subtypes in the Enneagram, you know, like, so you know, a sexual subtype and a mental subtype and a, what's the other one? Social, social, social subtype. So there you go. Social is the love part, right? So the first appetite, what's the first appetite to go though? What's the first desire to go? That's why it's on my intake form. I ask about it and people sometimes ask me, that's kind of a private question, but it really helps me understand where they're at. And that is, begins with an L. Nope. Angela and L. Libido. 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 Love isn't the first thing to go. The libido is the first thing in the body to drop. Wow. It's the first desire to go because it's not necessary for your personal survival, is it? No, it's not. It helps for the survival of the species. But as far as you personally, so that's always the first one. And it's a, it's a, good, it's a question of mine. How's your libido? And what's your appetite down there? You know, overall for in your being. If it's low, then... We need to start looking at why, because if you're full of vitality and joy, generally people want to connect. 
and they generally want to have sex and they generally want that, you know? And so, you know. Unless your libido is torpedoed by Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there's quite a line. Your libido was torpedoed by Catholicism. Or other religious. Yeah. That's quite a line. That's worth writing down. Your libido was torpedoed by Catholicism. Wow, that just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> so this go this ties in with adrenal function. Generally, appetite for intimacy too is driven by fire. And so, um, you know, I mean, you shake somebody's hand, they got a cold hand, kind of a turn off, you know? and a little clammy cold hand, you know, hot, warm hand, you know, like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hot and wet, that's the word, right? <laughs> okay, so the appetite. There's a libido, you say hot and wet a bunch of times. Oh, yes. That's why we have these dinners every week. Man. <laughs> it's like every kind of program and okay. So food, um, I'm going to try and make this not too long tonight. Food's the next appetite to go. And why do we? Why does the appetite go away? There's generally one besides stress. Yeah, that's the first question. Sure, like I didn't hardly eat anything today because I was in PTSD from being in public, but um, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Just for being in public is that bad now. Um, is when when the when this appetite goes away. Um, so when it goes away for food, then why 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 does it go away? What does stress cause? Depression. Physiologically, what does stress cause in the nervous system? A shift to which side of the nervous system? Yeah, cortisol. But which part, which arm of the nervous system? Sympathetic, parasympathetic, <laughs> yeah. and sympathetic. And when you're in sympathetic, you don't make digestive secretions. You make zero because the body's not concerned with that when it's stressed out. So you're setting yourself up for rot to eat when you're stressed out. It's just rotten down there. It's literally rotting. Wow. Because there's no secretions. Remember the, the the buffalo adrenal story? Well, that was the day before I scheduled to do uh, a male initiation right with the Mankind Project. I was staffing. I've been rehearsing this page and a half long um, context presentation it was called that I couldn't read. I had to have it memorized in front of 80 men. So I was pretty stressed out. I didn't have this thing memorized yet. And you know, you can't ad lib. And so reading and reading reading. And then the, Michael McAvoy comes over with the raw buffalo adrenal. He's all excited and sushis it up. And I'm like, sure. I'm drinking poo air tea too, which doesn't help the stomach acid folks. Um, so I ate this buffalo adrenal, and um, I knew the story would be relevant. And about 10 minutes after I ate it, it was like, something feels weird down there. And then it, it was like, someone stabbed me with a knife, and then another knife, and then like 10 knives, and I was down on the kitchen floor suddenly going, what did you put in that buffalo adrenal, dude? You're killing me. And then I, I didn't know what to do, and then I, I generally started to pray at that point, like, God, help me. I'm, I'm, I'm being stabbed by a knife, and it's at the buffalo adrenal. And then... And I got this message that you're just, you're stressed. You're not making any stomach acid. You got a big chunk of meat down there now. So Michael McAvoy, I mean, acid sounded like the worst thing in the world. He goes, why don't you put some apple cider vinegar in your mouth? You know, and, and um, him and Noel were there and they were trying to console me. And I'm doubled over just, Ugh! and, but sure enough, it was two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar and a little bit of water. And I just sipped on that. And slowly, it was just no stomach acid. And my stomach had gone into a cramp because there was no stomach acid. It's a good example. What happens now when I go too far into stress land? Today was a day of that where I've been pushing and pushing. I'm on the edge of burnout and I keep pushing and then I know how to walk that edge pretty well. And then today I was pushing and pushing and then nausea is where I know I've pushed too far. Yeah. and get nauseous. And that's a sign of sympathetic overload for some people. And so if you know where your edges are, then you can sort of, you, know, you can walk the tightrope a little easier and that's generally nausea. And I have had five days in the last four years where I've pushed beyond the nausea and I've just, I'll just go vomit and I'll feel better. I was a vomit king when I was a kid, but I never felt better afterwards. It's really odd. Um, so appetite for food. So it's stomach acid. We stop making stomach acid and we stop craving food. So generally the person that's been a meat eater their whole life, and they've had a lot of stress, a lot of stimulants. Then at some point they say, oh, I lost my appetite for meat. Said, yeah, because your stomach acid dropped. That's why. 
it's a natural response to not crave meat because you need that acid to process the meat, the protein, and the minerals. So you, you have to be in parasympathetic, rest and repair, fight or flight, right? Rest and repair, fight or flight. So that's why you eat when you're sitting. You don't do what I used to do, which was drive down the road and shave and eat and drive at the same time. Oh, yeah. Not smart. Shave, I have electric razor, chewing on food, and driving at the same time. I would sit in class, and I was kind of a savant in like third or fourth grade. I would be drawing with one hand, um, listening to the teacher with one ear, um, writing notes with my right hand to another friend over on the side. I'd have four or five things going on in school. I mean, it was just so boring. You guys can even relate, can't you? Yeah. yeah. You know, you had a bunch of shit going on because it was so freaking boring. Just watch the clock and shit, you know? Because it's like, I'm going to stop talking and go play in the yard. Yeah. So appetite for food goes. And then when the appetite for water goes, you're, you're kind of in trouble. Because um, it means these centers in here aren't working that well in the autonomic nervous system. So it's generally a bad sign to lose your thirst. But people don't have it. I had a client the other day, so they, they lost their thirst. And so he, he relies on just mechanically drinking water to make sure he gets enough. There's a cat channel on YouTube called Kitty Saurus, and one of the cats had a kidney stone so it didn't drink enough water. And um, the cat didn't have any, it didn't know, it didn't know to go drink water. It was really funny. She had to like force it, you know. And um, some people are that way. Appetite, so you kind of get the appetite thing, right? It's a good, it's a good road sign. You know, if it starts to drop, it needs to be investigated. Um, memory. So memory is also a, uh, Continuum, right? Memory is like there's long term and then there's concentration, which we would call that short term memory, right? When you focus on something, concentration. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed a big lapse in this the last uh, in our chemtrail universe. Um, my attention span and ability to take stuff on mentally has dropped significantly in the last five to ten years, especially the last five to six. Yeah. And um, I mean, all that aluminum coming in, it just aluminum just destroys your phospholipid layer and your nervous system. It's like a domino effect and you've got it. That's why to me, the, the saturated fat, cholesterol and protein rich foods are your antidote and bioflavonoids for that radiation. And that the heavy metals is a whole thing with liver function. And, but concentration um, is, so memory concentration, you said good memory is a, and uh, I do have the computer here. Let's see what he says about that. This guy, um, okay, memory is a continuum from moment to moment concentration to long-term memory from years ago. Can we focus on the activity we are engaged in? When we read, do we remember what we just read? Can we recall details about our life from one to 20 years ago? Again, the point here is not to beat ourselves up. Do we want more memory? Do we want to be able to focus? If it doesn't matter, then we can let go. And generally, the, the herbs that are, we kind of, this is the insight that I, the, the freak show of my life to give you guys is generally the plants that purify water, those plants are the, the plants that purify your nervous system. Specifically, uh, Bacopa and Gotacola, they're, they grow by the rivers in India, and so they're used to purifying water next to the river. Gotacola is a little more warming, Bacopa is a little more cooling, um, Bacopa is very bitter. Gold coal has more like a, a lettuce leaf, a little bit of an acrid and a spiciness to it. Those are well studied, well proven over thousands of years. I myself have had multiple concussions, traumatic brain injuries, broken necks, and um, I use them every day for the last 15 years and pretty sharp. And I think that they regenerate nerve tissue. I haven't been able to see any substantiation on it except for Bacopa in a fat soluble extract is shown to cause telomere regeneration, which is a DNA wow. thing. Bacopa. B-A-C-O-P-A. -A. Bacopa. Uh, it's the common name's water hyssop, but like little, it's cool. Uh, calamus is another one, but I haven't studied that one enough. It's a, it's a um, cattail. And I'm, it's in, um, putting in a lot of teas lately, and it, it's the emotional component. It brings stuck emotions up to the surface. And so I've been using a lot of it the last few months, and it's definitely getting stuff that was buried out to the surface. It's kind of effective that way. Uh, another one is St. John's wort. Now, St. John's wort is a boundary plant. I've been studying that one for quite a bit, and our ancestors used it for empaths who had weak psychic boundaries and were possessed easily. You know, um, 
with him. Like in homeopathic doses, one to five drops in a case like him. They don't need the physiologic. Yeah, yeah, St. John's wort. And so I have a blend called Boundaries Blend. I wasn't going to go into it, but the, the two other herbs in my Boundaries Blend are agrimony and wood betony. They're viewed by our ancestors to help people that were possessed a lot and then better psychic boundaries. Betony, B-E-T-O-N-Y, wood betony. And agrimony is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about those more in the future, but so they, when you have less interference in your brain from other psychic entities, then generally we do have better memory, right? Because we're not struggling with so much stuff in the sort of, you know, if you go radio dial, and that's one strong station, you don't want the up here, right? that's wind, right? That's vata, that's wind, that's something you don't want. Great, memory. Um, anything other to add on to that list? Ginkgo is associated with memory, but Ginkgo's pathway for better memory is through, um, is through stamina. Um, and vascular purification and radical it quenches radiation radicals the only trees to survive the nuclear blast in nagasaki and hiroshima were ginkgo trees i don't remember <laughs> i'm channeling uh, um so ginkgo is important for that and it also helps peripheral circulation so it helps circulation to the brain itself i use ginkgo in my max mental alert formula rosemary you can include in that conversation too Rosemary helps the brain by purifying the liver and sharpening awareness itself. Rosemary is well associated with memory and essential oil therapy too. Uh, any others? I use a valerian for some people will help their brain because it helps vascular circulation, but for others, valerian is um, it's too wiry. Believe it or not, that's probably all of it. Okay, good. Memory. Uh, humor and what I put on there is a um, diff marker of a condition of health, humor or fluidity. So he says you have good humor. And then I have a YouTube channel where I call the, the five conditions of higher health. And this one of these ties in with it. So when I talk about emotional fluidity, it's that we talked about the colon, right? Is the colon, the lung in the fall, they take in and they let go as their action, right? They take in and they let go. We'll have a good winter element, uh, water on that conversation in the next few weeks. So you're letting go then you can stay in the lightness of life, right? Because you're not stuck on the previous thought or the grudge or the doubt or the regret, right? So I know that I have good humor and fluidity when there is no trace. And there's a saying in Taoism, enlightened action, enlightened action leaves no trace. Enlightened action leaves no trace. That's yeah, raining. Oh. So I talked to Adyashanti about this. It was my last conversation with him uh, eight to 10 years ago um, at Inner Light. Uh, it was an amazing conversation. It lasted 35 minutes. My girlfriend was so mad at me that I took all the time for everybody for my one question, which ended up being 20 questions. But oh, man, I had it on film and everything. I watched it like 10 times and it was an amazing experience. Get there with the master for 35 minutes. But the query was about, um, you know, this is light and action leaves no trace. So I asked him, and we were, I was actually asking him about prayer was my original question. Can you pray for outcomes? And he's like, thy will be done only. No praying for outcomes. And he, he had some studies to back it up, like with trees. You pray for love for the tree, you leave one tree alone, and then you have one tree, thy will be done. And the thy will be done plant always grows the biggest and the healthiest versus your own limited egotistical love, which you think is so awesome. But it's pathetically tiny compared to the love of the universe. Humbling, but true. That's why I like natural vitamins. I don't want somebody's programmed probiotic blend. I want sauerkraut. Because some ego decided that, right? How do we know that ego is a little flawed? I wouldn't trust myself with a probiotic blend, that's for sure. <laughs> I wouldn't want to make one. So when we get, when we're in that fluidity, then we're, so the trace part then is doubt and regret and recycling thinking. The same thought keeps coming back. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. You know, the PTSD thoughts. That's the trace. It's not about karma in the outer world necessarily. It's in our own world when we're fluid. We're not stuck on something in the past. We just did, or someone else did. That's what repent is about, right? You repent, you do your work, or you forgive if someone else has harmed you. Repentance and forgiveness are the two gold standards to stay fluid, right? Or just knowing what you are, because if you know what you are, then it doesn't matter what anybody does. That's one of the debates I hear going around right now is that the, um, 
the human soul is being removed of the earth, the soul of the earth and the soul of the human is being removed from the planet. This is one of the, one of the, one of the yeah, it's one of the, but it, it just is impossible. Yeah. And because uh, it, it's not a mechanical thing. Uh, so to get stuck then, so that's what he led me to is like, okay, well, so what about this I will be done thing? And there's this force of nature that is sort of moving through me that, you know, there's like, if the peace you are what you seek is always and already present, then how do you unlighten yourself away from it? The forgiveness you seek is always and already present. The energy you seek, you know, it's, there, there's this thing that's prior to our thinking. Because our perceptive apparatus takes a millisecond to perceive reality. But reality's already moved on by the time you perceived it. Does that make sense? Abraham Hicks was asked a question once uh, how the channeled entity Abraham saw humans. That's what the answer was. Mm -hmm. past, tense. past tense. You live from our perspective, you guys live in past tense. Fascinating. Fascinating. So by living in the present, there's a certain levity to it. We all know what that feels like. You know, you feel light. It's clear. Clarity is part of it. They kind of go together. So enlightened action leaves no trace. So traces for the future. What are the future-based emotions? Anxiety is one. Future-based emotions. What's another one? Worry. Worry, yeah. Because yeah. I guess you could worry about the past. Can you worry about the past? Doubt. Yeah. You could have doubts about the future. Doubt could go both ways. Yeah. Future or past. Yeah, fear. Yeah. Fear, yeah. fear of the future. Yeah. Fear of the future. What else? Yeah. Indifference. That, that would be the lack of emotion, actually. Oh. Yeah. Hope for the future. Hope for the future. So that that's great. So if you get like, do we have regret and doubt? and grudges and that's kind of the stuff that goes in the past um there could be i guess there could be fear of things in the past that are sort of hidden in us you know like old wounds whatnot and so there's this balancing edge we're kind of walking on right not too much in the past not too much in the future hopefully we're present in this moment and um and then by example i went and took a nap for 20 minutes today you know i could call it a meditation if you will but really that's what kept me present with you now was I got my own rudder straight, so I wasn't bouncing all over the world with the Tasmanian devil, you know, running around. Um, that's not a guy that I want talking to the group. Uh, so take a rest. And so what I tell my clients, when you got a break in your schedule, do you choose to do one more thing or do you choose to rest? You rest, especially in today's world. We cram our schedules with pretty full. I mean, one of my best friends, um, She's a female mentor. She's like in her late 60s and she's retired basically and she's too busy. You're freaking retired. So, and humor. I don't think that people have to be laughter guys. I don't think that good humor necessarily means like, you know, I mean, I'll pick on Ben for me, like Ben Kogan kind of humor. Like, I just love that guy's humor. You know, who else can be a horsey on the beach? You know, like, <laughs> love Ben. So not everybody can walk around like that, right? Some people are just generally dry humor and some people know humor, but they have their own fluidity and their own way of, I think what it is is not taking any ourselves so seriously is the core one, right? Um, I have such an insane life that I, I stopped taking myself seriously a number of years ago. Um, and then clarity kind of speaks for itself a little bit, but I'm going to the gratitude one. So there's a word in Taoism called uncontrived, they would say, do without doing, act without acting. What? How do you do anything without doing it? I first saw that like 26 years ago. I, would, I, I stood on it for five years. How do you do without doing what? And then I realized the word that came to me once when I was surfing and it was like an effortless wave and felt really good and I was like, this was uncontrived. That's how you do without doing. It's uncontrived, it's effortless in the zone. You know those times when you're, you're so into what you're doing you forget time exists, you know? That's, what, that's kind of what they're saying. That's, that's kind of the last pointer is, do we, I've out of myself last week and I'm still there, is um, 
So let's do a survey here. I, I have gratitude naturally uncontrived in the day, maybe it's probably increased to about 4% of the day, down from two last week. Anybody else? Natural gratitude, what's your level for the day? Like, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, you gotta bring it, you gotta summon it sometimes and fake it till you make it because uh, yeah. I'm in the post office today and I'm, I'm doing my mantras going, what was my, may I be filled with loving kindness. I'm expanding in love, success, and abundance. And I inspire others to do the same. I was kind of spouting that out because the, de the demons were coming in like, oh, I'm fucking many things so long on the machine, wearing this brainwash mask, and breathing in Teflon, and oh, money bought me, oh, my money bought me, oh, that kind of shit. So anybody else, you yeah, know, gratitude. How often are you genuinely having gratitude in the day? If it's natural, you know, like I'm, I, like I said, I'm not there. It's two to four percent of the day. It, it kind of a naturally more. arises. I have more, but it's not every day. There's a good days. You have whole days without it. I say good days. I have twenty-five, thirty percent. Oh, great. Um, I, I have some days that are really good. I, it's almost always upon waking, like Jay said. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost always going to sleep. So that's just, you know, practice yeah. and, and, and habit now. And it's easy yeah. to get to. Um, but then, Which is Joe Dispenza's work. He's, yeah. done, he's done me some good service by, you know, that, that borderline between wake and sleep is a good time to start implanting little mantras right. in the consciousness. Right. Really important time. And it, it becomes a self-fulfilling um, mantra because it feels so good. When you really do it, and yeah. it, the fake it till you make it is absolutely fine with it because it yeah. really quickly makes it. You yeah. start saying what you're grateful for, and it's very quickly you're like, yeah, I really am grateful for that. And constantly yeah. realizing that we have grace all day long. It's yeah. really rare that things are fucked up and so bad that you can't really think. Right. If you think about it, you know, it seems like it's often, but it's really not that much. It's hours and hours and hours every day go by without anything wrong. Yeah. Right. right. True. Unless we're caught in. Right. There's no. something about yeah. if you can distract yourself from the problem a for a minute, then you get out of the loop right. of stress. Isn't it like a minute that or 67 helps. seconds or something? If you can distract yourself away from the stressful thought. Um, that's the whole point of a mantra or to find gratitude. It's like, I need to get away from that bad feeling. Because remember, my mantra is, how does that thought feel? Because you have a thought and your body Xerox is a thought in the form of a feeling. Yeah. And we don't often track that very well. Because then our body judges the, or then our brain judges the body's thought, the body's reaction. And then we, then our body has a response to the brain's reaction. Mm -hmm. We get stuck in this loop. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that's why the thing until you make it. You had a right. question? Well, if, I'm, if, if I do the things that I like, I'm just naturally grateful. Like, I like getting sunlight and watching the sunsets. And being by the fire and being in the woods and reading and right. hanging out with people I like. And I, I have those things almost every day. So it, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I actually thought about, I was kind of jealous of you today. I was a little bit mm. envious. I was like, God, I want to have a life like jeans. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 there you go. Where's your baseball? Uh, yeah. You're a good example, Jean. Um, because I'm a very, I mean, I'm a, you know, you've seen me in enough action now. Like I'm, I'm running around a lot, and uh, it's just a, I'm just trying to do too much for myself, and that's why the pulling in, and that's where the gratitude starts to go away. If I have a slower life, which I was, I'm heading back there, then yeah, that that gratitude just like when I went and meditated, it, it's always there. It's like a vein underneath it all. And let's go be quiet for a minute. It's like, oh, there it is. And as my teacher Ajashanti said, never forget that diamond. It's in your pocket. Don't ever forget that. Yeah. You know, and it is easy to forget, though. Yeah, he says, just like your diamond in your pocket, which um, I need to honor him. There's a poem that I'm going to get on the recording and then we can. We didn't. Anybody else want to talk about uh, their natural gratitude? Um, well, I was aware of it since I've been taking this stuff for the pain in my mouth thing. I was aware of it and I have not been focusing on gratitude. Because of the pain? Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then oh. that's a good idea to start thinking about when the pain is gone, start to be in more gratitude mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, when is it going to happen again? You know what I mean? And right. Like tonight, I totally didn't take any of the stuff I was going to take because I just decided, you know what, I, I, don't, I want to be present tonight here. I don't mm -hmm. want to be 
Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. It buzzed out. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, it feels like it feels like we're gonna. Fit. This is nine ten, and so I try to be done by nine. Um, so this is Adyashanti. Um, he has a number of strange titled books. This one's called "My Secret Is Silence." My secret is silence. My secret is silence. Um, it's poetry, but I'm only going to read one, and it's called "Enlightenment Is a Gamble," and it's sort of trickster stuff like Hafiz. I think uh, some of you will appreciate this. Enlightenment is a gamble. Time to cash in your chips. Put your ideas and beliefs on the table. See who has the bigger hand, you or the mystery that pervades you. Time to scrape the mind's shit off your shoes. Undo the laces that hold your prison together and dangle your toes into emptiness. Once you've put everything on the table, once you've put all your currency is gone and your pockets are full of air, and all you've got left to gamble with is yourself. Go ahead, climb up onto that velvet top of the highest stakes table. Place yourself as the bet. Look God in the eyes and finally, for once in your life, lose. Wow. Nice. Wow. Oh, Jashanti, my secret is silence. My secret is silence. Silence. Oh silence. God, that would be awful. My secret is science. <laughs> because science. Triple big eye emoji. Ah! <laughs> I want t-shirts that say science is the new religion. And on the back it says my science is the real science. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, anything else for the recorded part? We can get. You can still record, but I, I can dub that out if you want. Okay, we're going to say signing out. Uh, science is silence. <laughs>